These verses in 1 Corinthians 11 are possibly the most difficult to translate and interpret, as well as the easiest to twist and distort. I guess it largely depends on where one's prior commitments lie, which church tradition we have been aligned with, and which teaching we've heard. This is a good example of how often we do not come to the text of Scripture neutral, um, taking passages like this in chapter 11. The issue of head coverings and male and female behaviour and actions leads on to the Corinthian problem at the Lord's Supper, which we'll cover tomorrow. I'll only do the first part today. Please pause the video now to make sure that you've read these very difficult to translate verses, 15 verses of chapter 11, and read them very carefully. Paul commends them for maintaining the traditions that Paul himself brought to the church. But he must clarify certain practices now that he has obviously heard about that are undermining and seriously undermining the church. Men are not to cover their hair, but women are to cover their hair. Why is this? Well, if we look back at uh, Corinthian culture and Ro Greco-Roman culture in general, men wore what is called togas. When they went into the pagan temples to pray, they would pull the toga up over their head before praying. Now, this is almost exclusively the practice of wealthy elite, and therefore a sign of their high social status. It was essentially a form of virtue signaling, of power play, of self-promotion, of look at me, similar to the Pharisees in the gospel that Jesus so strongly chides. Paul comes in and says, no, a gospel no. So why, conversely, did the women have to cover their hair? Bear in mind the temple prostitutes that operated in Corinth and around the towns uh, likely uh, had shaved heads. They had no hair. But hair was seen as a kind of veil, therefore a sign of loyalty and commitment to their husband. For a woman not to pray with her head covered would therefore have been viewed as sending the wrong signals, showing availability to pagan temple immorality and promiscuity. Uh, it would be seen as a dishonouring of husbands and, and the wider church family. Paul insists on coverings as a sign of marriage, which doubles as a sign of the woman's authority to speak, which women are clearly allowed to do in the early church, obviously. And in this way, Paul subverts the, the ritual pagan prostitution racket of the Athena cults, thank God. Verses 8 to 12 uh, are about the interdependence of man to woman and woman to man. And this is a, a theological argument that Paul uses based on the creation account in Genesis, concluding with the rationale for a woman to have her head covered. And then Paul says enigmatically, because of the angels. And now we come to a very difficult to translate phrase. This is an enigmatic phrase uh, of, uh, of great challenge to the interpreter. The, gr the Greek word translated angels, angelos, means messenger. And it can be translated angel or messenger, depending on the context. And the messenger can be a human messenger. To think in terms then, if we, to, if we were to make this a, a, of, of a, an angelic being, would render the interpretation of that verse eternally confusing and strange, I think. I don't think that was Paul's intention. But when understood as a human messenger, we see something much more clearly. Greco-Roman culture was watching the church. The Jewish community in every town were watching the church. They would also watch and uh, await and, and then, if necessary, uh, as they so wanted to do, report it. They would send messengers to report the church in their subversive Christian blood-eating, flesh-eating worship rituals. I mean, think, how else was Paul brought before Gallio and the judgment seat in Acts 18.12? By the angels, by the messengers. Anyway, so headship, coverings and authority within gender roles uh, Paul argues, are based in creation. Paul argues now that they are to be distinctive. These roles are to be distinctive, but without mimicking pagan idolatry. So they are uh, distinctive in a Christian way, but not in a way that draws unnecessary attention to itself in the face of the angels or messengers, or as we would say today, the secret police. So Paul's premise in verse 3 sets us up nicely. 
we are offered a theological rationale of Trinitarian relations, God to Christ, Christ to man, man to woman. This is not about subordination or gender supremacy, though some church traditions work very hard at saying otherwise to their shame. It is about the headship of men and women based in Trinitarian theology, based in Trinitarian relations. And thus in this peculiar cultural context in which this must be rooted, the gospel dignifies men and women and God is glorified in the meantime.